Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to a world of laughter, learning, and entertainment. Thank you for joining us on this exploration of Gwenya Pau, a story of an African princess. We hope you find it enlightening. Gwenya Pau, a story of an African princess is an 1891 novel by Joseph Jeffrey Walters and is the earliest surviving novel published in English by a black African. Brace yourself for a captivating discussion on background as we explore its nuances and implications. Joseph Jeffrey Walters was born in Liberia to their parents sometime in the as his exact birth date is not known. Between 1878 and 1882 Walters joined the Cape Mount Mission and later moved to the United States pursuing a college education. He studied at Stora College in West Virginia and in 1889 began studying at Oberlin College in Ohio. After completing his bachelor's degree, he returned to Liberia in 1893 on account of his worsening tuberculosis. He began teaching at the Cape Mount Mission in 1894 but died in November of the same year. As a Christian missionary, Walters would have seen firsthand how the Protestant Church particularly operated a system of proselytism in Africa which often involved the teaching of Western cultural values to locals. Let's now enter the realm of plot summary and discover the fascinating stories it has to tell. The story begins with a descriptive introduction to a tribe of people called the Vey today called the Vey, of which Gwenya Pau is a part, daughter of a chief of a town called Galna. Upon her father's death at the age of four, Gwenya Pau was betrothed to a man called Kaikundu who paid a handsome sum of money for her future hand in marriage. But Gwenya, with her independent bearing and scornful air, grew up to resent this man and this local system of the purchasing of multiple wives, falling in love instead with a local youth called Momo and vowing that she would rather drown than marry her appointed suitor. On her 16th birthday, Kaikundu comes to see her to discuss the prospects of their marriage but she rejects him, saying she would just as soon love a monkey, a gesture which is ultimately futile as her marital fate has already been determined. As a result, Gwenya decides to run away with her friend, Jasa. The two girls hide in an anthill for a day for fear of being detected and continue their journey at night. They are immediately panicked by the approaching presence of a group of local men, but they move along before coming across the girls. Just after their departure, an injured elephant pursued by Ave hunters stomps past the girls and inadvertently crushes a side of the anthill and exposes the hiding location of the girls. The hunters fortunately fail to notice them and continue in their chase of the animal. Traveling on, the girls come to a rice farm and, after disguising their faces, they join a crowd assembled at a king's house celebrating a wedding. Horrified that another woman may be being subjected to the same treatment of forced marriage that Gwenya herself had experienced, the two girls endeavor to inquire about the couple and are told that the husband in question purchased his bride after she had been previously accounted for by another man, a gross breach of marital tradition. The girl herself ultimately had no decision to make in the affair. The next day, Gwenya encounters a woman who tells her of her own life story and her unhappy marriage to a man she does not love. The woman's story, one of her separation from her true love, is not dissimilar to Gwenya's own experience. Her story ends with the disheartening conclusion of her resignation to an unhappy life and to the fact she will never see her lover again. The girls travel onward and come across a beautiful grove, a sacred spot for the burial of kings. They encounter a council in session reviewing judicial cases in which local men have been accused of certain behaviours towards their wives. The men are acquitted under the pretense that a man's wife is his property to do with what he likes and Gwenya is furious but says nothing upon Jasa's advice. Moving on, the girls travel for a few days, enjoying their surroundings and the gaiety of life until they are forced to hide behind a mango tree from a group of men that approach. Gwenya and Jasa overhear the men talking about their search for them and the reward that Kaikundu has offered for their return. Hiding half dead with fright, the girls wait until the men move on and quickly head in the opposite direction. The girls come across a village the next day to find in progress a mourning ceremony for a recently deceased local man. 
Tribal customs dictate that all in the village must mourn for the deceased, but as the man had been a terror to his wives whilst he was alive, his wives are pleased to hear of his death. As a result, they are killed for their behaviour, one murdered and two forced to drink a fatal draught of salsa wood. Seeing this, Gwenya Pau and Jasa quickly leave and head back to the road. The girls come across another village where they are welcomed warmly by a family into their home. As they are preparing to sleep for a night, a modest-looking fellow enters the home and identifies Gwenya Pau upon sight. Not knowing who the man is, the girls take flight. They continue to run for many hours into the next day. As they slow down in an open field they realize they've been spotted by a group of men carrying weapons. One of the men identifies himself as a fellow native of Galena and explains that he recognizes her as the daughter of the town's chief. Conceding that this is the case, Gwenya and Jasa head back to the village escorted by the men. Upon arrival, they are taken to the town's court. The questioner does not believe Gwenya's claims of her heredity and royal importance and so the two girls are placed in the stocks for the night while someone is sent to ascertain the truth. During the night, the girls manage to break themselves free and escape. While on the run they come across a stream by which there are a few fishermen, one of which offers the girls a lift in his canoe. After navigating a brief storm, they land in a nearby fishing village, where they find work on a rice farm. They work so effectively that their fellow workers are impressed by their prowess. At the end of the day, over a meal, one of the worker women makes a speech praising the conviviality of life. The male overseer interrupts the women's conversation to reprimand them for slacking off work. The next day, Gwenya Pau and Jasa set about joining a group to go fishing in a sacred river. Local religious tradition holds that no one is permitted to put his hand or foot in the stream for fear of angering the spirits who convene there. In her haste to cross the river, Gwenya plunges into the water, much to the horror of the locals that are accompanying her. After hearing nothing more of Gwenya's sin for the rest of the day, the two girls decide to leave the following morning. That evening, as the girls are laying down to sleep, they are visited by a man claiming to have been sent searching for Gwenya by Momo, who had hoped to buy her hand in marriage before she ran away. Thrilled by the news, Gwenya struggles to sleep and passes the time recounted to Jasa how she and Momo met. Gwenya eventually sleeps and experiences a sequence of dreams involving a demon and later a chance meeting with Momo in the ranks of a religious congregation. The following day, the two girls leave with their escort to find Momo. They reach a town where, while the man is enquiring about Momo, Gwenya recognizes another male from Galena and flees with Jasa in a canoe. By the next morning they are on Tosa Island. After making arrangements to travel with the town's chief by canoe, they board his vessel along with another man who eye the girls rather suspiciously. Arriving a few hours later and following directions in the town they have landed, the girls find themselves accosted by their fellow passenger who announces that Kaikunda has men all over the region looking for them and that he will be bringing them back to him. On the canoe ride back, Gwenya Pau jumps overboard, shouts that she would prefer to drown than to be Kaikundu's wife and dies. Without wasting any more time, let's jump into the fascinating world of oppression of women. The treatment of women in Bay culture is thematically central to Walter's text. Gwenya Pau's journey sees her interact with a number of women who have been victimized and marginalized as a result of gender inequality ingrained into African culture. It is through these interactions that Walters attempts to present his persuasive discourse on the flawed marital system of marrying off girls at a young age and the common practice of men taking multiple wives. This is seen for example, in the story that the old lady with the baby on her back tells to Gwenya, explaining that she is unhappy with her betrothal to a man she does not love and that she feels she has wasted her life serving a husband she did not desire to marry. Institutionalist misogyny permeates the text, men frequently condemn the position of women in their society, equating them to cattle or objects to be traded. Men in positions of power the judge at the court in the beautiful grove, the Muslim cleric, the judge who refutes Gwenya's royal status, for example subscribed particularly vehemently to this attitude. 
Brace yourself for an in-depth analysis as we navigate through African religion versus American Christianity and its far-reaching implications. Walters often uses references to and excerpts from the Bible in order to embellish his narrative. As a Christian missionary, this perspective shapes the way he presents their culture, relevant passages taken from the Bible and even various quotes attributed to William Shakespeare seek to make the plight of the African nation more approachable for his intended American Christian readership. While the text is, compared to similar novels, accepting of Africa and its potential, it operates on the assumption that Africa can be made better through the introduction of Western ideals, particularly those of Protestantism. Let's now enter the realm of nature and discover the fascinating stories it has to tell. Walters often celebrates the geographical beauty of Africa as an element of its undiscovered, potential value, long, episodic passages of natural imagery intersects Gwenya Pau's journey. Encounters with animals and humans alike particularly men presents the creatures tigers, leopards, elephants, etc. as allies in the girl's mission, whereas the more substantial threat to their safety is more often in the form of man. Don't forget to check out my other videos for more valuable content.